Evangelism. We're talking about evangelism is the act of evangelizing. And most of us would have a fairly good understanding of what that means. We're talking about reaching out to lost souls with the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's evangelizing. The act of doing that is evangelism. Now we can do that in a whole lot of different ways, but that's the basis of what we're talking about. Reaching out with the gospel. Reaching out trying to teach people the saving message of Jesus Christ. When we're talking about the church and what we're supposed to be about, bottom line, we need to, re we need to always remember, bottom line, we have a mission to glorify God, to bring Him glory, to glorify Him in the way we live and what we do and how we conduct ourselves and the worship that we offer to Him as the church. But now, basic to glorifying Him, we need to remember that our basic mission as far as the work is concerned is to evangelize. It's to reach out to lost souls with the gospel and then having done that to teach the further message of Christianity to those who have been evangelized. You can look in Matthew chapter 28 and verses 19 and 20 as Matthew recorded what we call the Great Commission. Jesus told the apostles, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. The King James Version says, go and teach all nations. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age of the world, amen. When you break down that particular Great Commission commandment from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He tells us first to go. That's what we need to be doing with evangelism. A lot of times I think a lot of members of the Lord's Church want the lost to come on their own. They don't want to have to put forth the effort of going, but the very first word in the commission is go. Now we can go in different ways, and in some cases, some of the ways in which we go will lead people to come to us, to want to hear more, to want to learn more. But we have to put forth the effort, however it may be directed, to do the going. And then he says, teach all nations or make disciples of all the nations. And obviously that is done through teaching. We're reaching out to people with the gospel message. We're teaching them. And then in response to that, Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we reach out with the gospel message. And as they respond to it in a positive way, they're baptized into Christ. We assist them to, come, to be reborn into Christ, baptizing them for the remission of their sins. But then it's not over because Jesus then says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so the teaching is to go on. As the Lord's church, we are to teach and teach, and teach, and teach incessantly. We should never stop teaching God's Word. We should resist all of the social temptations to get caught up in kind of a good old folks club, whether we're older or younger, into just social kinds of getting together. We are about the serious business of evangelizing, trying to spread the gospel. And we need to always keep that forefront in our minds. That's our basic work as the church, to teach the gospel. Now when we think about evangelism, we often think along serious lines. And so we think about the need to evangelize. As Jesus 
told the apostles in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. He said, look unto the fields, for they are already white unto harvest. Pray therefore the Lord of harvest that he will send forth reapers. So we think about the need to evangelize. There are so many lost souls out there. In our class this morning in the auditorium, we talked about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where he talked about the straight way, the, uh, the straight way and the narrow gate, the way of truth that leads to eternal life and salvation. And he said, few are going down that way. But then he contrasted that with the broad way and the wide gate that leads to everlasting condemnation in hell. And he said, many are going down that way. Now, we don't like that, we don't like that statement. We want to reinterpret it. We want to turn it around and we want to make everybody okay, everybody saved. But that's not what our Lord said. He said, most people are going down the path toward eternal condemnation and only the few are going down the path toward eternal life in heaven. We need to recognize that. We have been commissioned by our Lord to teach the gospel. To teach the gospel. Those of us gathered here this evening, we're part of the church here at Sunny Slope. And that is our mission. That is our work. It's your work as an individual Christian, an individual member of this congregation, an individual member of the Lord's church. Your work is to evangelize. Don't try to put it off on somebody else and say, well, you know, the elders need to be doing that. Or the, the preacher needs to be doing that. Or the Bible class teachers need to be doing that. Or just somebody other than me needs to be doing that. No, it's your work. You're part of the church. It's your commission. You're responsible for reaching out to the lost with the gospel. Now we can do that in kind of a corporate way as the congregation, but that does not absolve us from our responsibilities individually. So the, the lost are out there everywhere. Many years ago, somebody had, had calculated, I don't know what kind of, uh, methodology they use to come to this, this particular uh, analysis, but somebody many years ago, and so if they were anywhere near accurate in their calculations, just think how much worse it is today. They said that, that by, their, by the calculation that had been reached that the line of people who are without Christ at any given moment in time is 750,000 miles long if you just lined them up in single file. That that would reach around the earth 30 times and that it grows, the line grows longer by 20 miles every day. Now that's a staggering, staggering image that is being portrayed for us. The need to evangelize is stark. We also think about our responsibility to evangelize. As I just said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all the nations. As Mark recorded the Great Commission, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be lost. There is no other way to salvation except through the gospel of Christ. There is no other plan of salvation except that gospel plan. People keep trying to change it. They keep trying to alter it. They keep trying to make it more palatable. They keep trying to explain things away and, and just kind of brush things aside that, that they don't like to have to recognize as responsibility and, and righteous living and faithfulness and so on. But that's all done by man. We still need to focus on the basic gospel message. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And so our mission ought to be to reach out 
with the gospel message and lead as many people to be baptized into Christ as we possibly can. Nothing else compares when it comes to things that we might be caught up in as far as recreation or even in our work lives. When you stop and think about it, our basic mission should be spiritual in direction should be to fulfill that commission that Jesus Christ has given us, our responsibility to evangelize. And then we also think about the hard work of evangelism, and I'm afraid that this is what really turns a whole lot of people off because they don't like the idea of having to expend the energy, to use the time, to put forth the effort, to make the preparation, to make the visits, to conduct the Bible studies, again, to put in the time, to pour out their heart in prayer. They don't want to have to do that. It's inconvenient. But in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, Paul said, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And then we read similarly, a little bit more succinctly in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13. And there Paul writes, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not grow weary in doing good. We need to be about serving the Lord every day and all day long. I'm not saying that we don't need to take out some time to relax and have some fun, something to kind of refresh and recharge, but in our culture today, the refreshing and the recharging is taking precedent over all everything else just about. And we need to recognize that we're going to be held accountable for this when the Lord comes again. Now, when the Lord comes again, we, and we're, we're pretty tight about this. We say we need to make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, and we need to make sure that people have understood correctly and obeyed correctly, that they've got to be immersed in the water for the remission of their sins, understanding what they're doing and why they're doing it, and that they need to make sure that they're part of the Lord's church and not some denomination, and that they make sure that they're worshiping God according to what the scriptures teach, and we're hard and fast about about that. And we should be, because that's the truth of what the Scriptures teach. But the Scriptures also teach the truth that we're supposed to be out evangelizing. Do you think that the Lord, when He comes again, is going to hold us responsible for making sure that we were baptized correctly and taught that correctly, and that we worship correctly, and that we were part of His church correctly? But if we neglect our responsibility, our direct command to evangelize, do you think he's going to say, that's okay. That one didn't matter that much. Do you think we're going to be able to point our fingers at other places and say, or other people and say, well, I, I, they should have been doing that. Now, we can't all do it in the same way, but we all have the responsibility so we think about the need, we think about the responsibility, we think about the hard work, and if that's all that we think about, we may come away with something of a less than positive image in our mind of what we can accomplish as we go out and evangelize. So I want us to think about another one. And that's the joy of evangelism. I want us to think about fourfold joy of evangelism this evening. And we'll look at it fairly quickly and briefly. You can expand it on your own. The fourfold joy of evangelism. First, evangelizing, the leading of lost souls to salvation, brings joy in heaven. Wouldn't you love to cause the angels in heaven to rejoice? Because you have reached out to lost souls and led them to come to salvation through Jesus Christ. Isn't that what God sent his son into this world to do? 
And why would we think that we don't need to be about his business? In Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 1, Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 1, notice what our Lord himself teaches, that all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one who, the, which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Do you get the joy? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Joy in heaven over a sinner coming to repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace that which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents." evangelism, evangelizing lost souls, leading them to salvation through Jesus Christ brings joy to heaven. What a concept. Don't you think that God rejoices when a person comes to repentance and turns to Jesus Christ for forgiveness and salvation? Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the, lack, the Lord is not, slack, or is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Joy in heaven, joy among the angels of God, and I would suggest to you joy with God himself over sinners who come to salvation through Jesus Christ. And our mission is to lead them to that salvation and bring the occasion for joy in heaven. Evangelism brings joy to the one evangelizing in that he realizes that he is helping a soul escape the condemnation of sin, and come to salvation in Christ. How happy would you be if you were driving along and you saw a terrible accident take place right in front of you, and you were able to stop and pull off to the side, and you jumped out, out of your car and you rushed to the scene, you were one of the first on, on the scene, and you saw someone who was injured terribly, and whatever needed to be done, you were able to assist that person to get out of that life-threatening situation, and you were able to take care of them until the paramedics arrived on the scene and were able to administer whatever kind of assistance they needed and then you got the word later on that person survived. You'd be happy. You'd rejoice. You'd be thankful over the service that you were able to render to help that person live, survive. And that would be wonderful. What a great feeling. But we're talking about on the physical plane. And later on, unless the Lord comes again first, that person's ultimately going to die, physically. But imagine how much more 
you would have to rejoice over if you looked at Joe or Harry or Bob or Sally or Jane and you saw them come into the church building Sunday after Sunday and they sat down and they sang praises to God and they worshiped God and they were happy being a part of the Lord's body and one of them or two of them or maybe all of them eventually took their place teaching a Bible class or you saw one of them or two of them or maybe all of them bringing visitors with them and trying to work with them, trying to help them learn the gospel. You'd feel really good about that, wouldn't you? And you'd remember you had a hand in leading them to salvation. Maybe you were the first one who invited them Maybe you sat down with an open Bible and studied with them or went through a video study with them. Maybe you did some counseling with them along the way. Maybe you even baptized them into Christ. And oh, you're so, such a warm feeling, so much thankfulness. It wasn't you who gets the glory. God gets the glory. But you're so thankful that God used you in that way to help that soul escape eternal condemnation. There's nothing that you ever could have done or ever could do that would be of more benefit to that individual than what you did in leading them to salvation through Jesus Christ. Evangelism brings joy to the one evangelizing, realizing what he's done to help a soul live eternally and escape eternal condemnation. The wise man wrote in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, he who wins souls is wise. We need to read that verse. We need to burn it into our brain and remember that always someone has suggested he who does not try to win souls is otherwise. Why would we think that we don't have the responsibility? Why would we not want to share in the joy? Why would we not want to bring joy to heaven by reaching out to the lost with the saving message of the gospel, bringing joy to the angels in heaven and bringing joy to that individual? who escapes salvation and having the occasion to rejoice ourselves. The wise man went on in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 20, 25. He said, a true witness delivers souls. An alternate translation there is a true witness saves lives. Could you imagine saving somebody's physical life and not being happy over it? There would be few experiences that you could experience in life that would compare to it. Oh, but there's one that would surpass it by far. And that is saving a person's eternal soul by teaching them the gospel by helping them to come to forgiveness and salvation through Jesus Christ. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 126, beginning with verse 5, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. We understand the physical application of planting the seeds in the, in the field and harvesting the crop, but make the spiritual application. It's even more profound and it gives us even greater occasion to rejoice. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. 
And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Now, Paul didn't get his nose out of joint. He didn't get his priorities out of order. He didn't get all the big head and, the, and, and, and become glory-seeking. He simply wanted to serve God by helping as many lost souls come to salvation as possible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, he writes this second recorded letter to the Corinthian congregation. And he's reflecting back upon something he had written in the first letter, where he had called for the congregation to exercise church discipline in the matter of the young man who had been committing adultery with his father's wife, apparently a stepmother. And that had been done, we would assume, because in the second letter, in chapter 7, he's reflecting upon that. The young man has come to repentance. And look at what Paul says, Now I rejoice that your sorrow led to repentance. The young man's eternal soul was in jeopardy because of the sin in which he had been living and Paul called upon the congregation, you need to straighten him out or help him straighten out. You need to teach him the truth. You need to discipline him. And even to the point, he says, where if you have to withdraw fellowship from him to shake him to his senses so that he knows he can't live like that righteously and faithfully before God. And apparently the congregation responded in kind and the young man came to his senses and repented and Paul says, I rejoice that your sorrow led to repentance. Not just that the young man was made sorry, but that his sorrow led him to change his life, to repent. Evangelism brings joy to the one evangelizing. He realizes he has helped a soul escape eternal condemnation. Number three, evangelism brings joy to other Christians who hear of souls coming to salvation. What a blessing it is. What a blessing it is to hear of somebody who has been taught the gospel and learn that they have been baptized into Christ as a result. I wish you could, you could get a whole lot of the emails that I receive hearing from mission, uh, from, from uh, preachers in mission fields talking about take, taking the gospel to a new village where there is no congregation somewhere in the interior of India or someplace else in some other part of the world and talking about how many people came to hear the gospel and how many were baptized into Christ as a result. How new congregations have been started as a result of the evangelizing that was done in those settings. And I sit there time after time and, and so frequently it happens. And I sit there and I just say, praise God. Thank God. Souls are being saved. When you hear of somebody in Omaha, in another congregation who's been baptized, you rejoice over it. A soul has been saved. When you get, hear the announcement here at the congregation, so-and-so has taught so-and-so the gospel, and they were baptized into Christ, and you rejoice over that because a soul has been saved. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 18, the apostles and the brethren in Judea, upon understanding God's direction to 
teach the Gentiles the gospel. And the Jewish Christians, many of them in the early years of the church, had difficulty letting go of what had been that exclusivity in their mind as to who was the real people of God. These Gentiles who didn't even believe in God, they looked down upon them from a spiritual perspective as heathens. But now the gospel was being carried to them by Paul and Barnabas and, and others probably as well. And they were be, being baptized. Many of them were becoming Christians. And so the message comes to the apostles and the brethren in Judea. And the text tells us that they glorified God. It's interesting that the text tells us that at first they became silent. And then it said they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And in Acts chapter 15 and verse 3, when Paul and Barnabas were reporting of the conversion of many Gentiles to Christ, their report caused great joy to all the brethren. Evangelism brings joy to other Christians who hear of lost souls coming to salvation. What greater thing could we hear about somebody we know or somebody we don't know? What more wonderful news could we receive than so-and-so became a Christian? So-and-so was baptized. Let me tell you, mamas and daddies can rejoice far more over hearing about little Johnny being baptized or little Sally being baptized than hearing about they just got a full ride scholarship to some major university. Now that's a good thing, but their being baptized far surpasses. The other does not even begin to compare as to their occasion to rejoice. Or you hear about a brother or a sister in the family, a sibling who has made up their mind to be baptized into Christ. Or maybe a mother or a father or a co-worker. What an occasion to rejoice. What an occasion. And then fourth, evangelism obviously brings joy to the sinner who is baptized into Christ for the remission of his sins. When we read the account right at the close of the, of the, the Ethiopian who was baptized, on his way back home, after having been to Jerusalem to worship under Judaism, he learns the gospel going back and he makes up his mind, he's ready to be baptized. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 39, after Philip had baptized him, the text tells us now when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing, rejoicing. He had occasion to rejoice. He had just come to salvation through Jesus Christ. He had just been forgiven of all of his sins. He had just been redeemed by the blood of Christ. He had just been brought into a right relationship with God. And he went on his way rejoicing at what had happened to him, at the decision that he had made. In Acts chapter 13, verses 47 and 48, and here, for the Lord, for so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you, should be for, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. They were glad they rejoiced. 
in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, beginning with verse 33, we read toward the end of the account of the Philippian jailer being baptized into Christ. And notice, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when they had brought them into the house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. There was no greater occasion for rejoicing on the part of that man than what had happened to him and his household, his family, that very night, they had been baptized into Christ. They had come to salvation in the, through the Savior, forgiven of their sins, redeemed, bought back, and adopted by God as, one of his, as, as some of his children. In 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, chapter 1 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at how Peter puts it. Beginning with verse 6. Peter writes, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Now notice he says, you greatly rejoice that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it, be though, if, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory." receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Look at that. You rejoice with inexpressible joy. Nothing compares to being saved. Nothing compares to being forgiven. Nothing compares to coming into Christ. Inexpressible joy on the part of the sinner who has come to salvation in Jesus Christ. The reason I asked the song leader to lead that song before we got into the lesson is because of what Revelation 21 in verse 4 portrays for us. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. That is a description of part of what it will be like in heaven for eternity. No more tears, no more sorrow. No more pain, no more sickness, no more dying. That's what we look forward to, and that's what we are charged by our Lord with trying to help all of those who are not yet saved to look forward to, to get a glimpse of and to open their hearts toward so that they will be ready to receive the gospel message and obey it, be baptized into Christ, so that they can look forward to no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more dying, because they will have taken their first step on that road toward heaven. Joy in heaven. Joy on the part of the one reaching out with the gospel and evangelizing. Joy on the part of other Christians who hear of people coming to salvation in Jesus Christ. And oh, incredible joy on the part of the one who has just been saved 
as he was buried with his Lord in baptism for the remission of his sins. Joy. 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 And we should be joyful to be privileged to carry that message of joy to the world around us. They can't hear without a teacher. They can't be saved without the gospel. And we're the ones who are charged to go and teach. If you need to become a Christian this evening, we encourage you to take that step. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and surrender to him in baptism for the remission of your sins so that you can come into him wherein there is salvation and that it is nowhere else. If you have slipped from the way after having done that, pray to God for forgiveness, repenting of your sins. If you need the prayers of the church, we're here. Step forward and ask us. If you need to ask God to help you refocus your direction in life, the importance of what you're doing, if you need to pray for a new heart, as we read about in the scriptures, to help you see the importance of evangelizing, of reaching out with the gospel, you on a personal basis, then we encourage you to pray that prayer. If you'd like us to pray it with you, we'd love to do that. If you need to come, won't you come right now as we stand together and sing?